This week, you've invited a rather different guest, Alison. Not a teacher, but a professional scientist who we both admire. Yes, Liam. You know, for some time, we've both been puzzling, haven't we, over the COVID death statistics? How are they recorded? How reliable are they? What about all these cases that sound so alarming? I thought we'd benefit from speaking to a, a terrific expert. Dr. John Lee has been a professor of pathology and an NHS consultant pathologist for over 20 years, director of cancer services at the Rotherham NHS Foundation Trust and clinical director of pathology. John's also been a university teacher for over 30 years and listeners may have seen him on TV presenting two award-winning Channel 4 series, Anatomy for Beginners and Autopsy, Life and Death. John is now the spokesman on pathology for heart, H-A-R-T. We've, we've talked about this last week, Liam. It's a new public health consultancy which is aiming to provide a much wider multidisciplinary perspective on the COVID crisis than we get from some of the SAGE scientists. I know, Liam, you and I have both hugely admired the articles on COVID and lockdown that John Lee has written for The Spectator in the past 10 months. Absolutely. Back in May, he had a terrific cover story with the striking headline, The Way COVID Deaths Are Being Counted is a National Scandal. So I began by asking John, is the way the UK has been counting COVID deaths to be trusted? The thing is, in this crisis, we've been counting deaths in a way that we've never previously counted deaths, and particularly deaths for a respiratory pathogen. So... Every winter, you know, quite a lot of people die of respiratory infections, especially elderly people, because it's one of the ways in which elderly people do die. And the way those deaths are recorded are normally something fairly non-specific, like bronchopneumonia or uh, pneumonia or even old age. Mm. But the fact is, since February, with, with COVID becoming a notifiable disease, we've been attributing a cause or trying to attribute a cause to, to many of the deaths that we've been recording. And it's effectively made it very difficult indeed to know how many deaths are really due to COVID as opposed to how many deaths are just with COVID having been found uh, by testing in, in the patient. You also said in that spectator piece that some of your colleagues have been dismayed by changes introduced during the epidemic, which meant that pathology was not able to play the role it should have in helping us to understand the new disease. Is that what you meant by the changes, this, this different form of notification? Well, I think recording recording the death in this way just means it's become, well, I think it's become very difficult to know the role that COVID is playing in what we're seeing in the health service over the last year. Clearly, it's a new virus. Clearly, we have had an epidemic of it. I mean, what, what I've been trying to think about maybe a way in which we can present what's been happening over the last year to let people think about it more clearly. And I think we can do that by thinking about three things. And the three things are the nature of the threat due to this virus, the effectiveness of the responses that we've introduced to it, and then the cost, other costs of those responses. And I think if we just look at what's happened over the last year, it seems to me anyway that the, the nature of the threat has been exaggerated and the effectiveness of the responses that have been introduced have been exaggerated, while the costs of the responses that we've introduced have been greatly underestimated. And you put those three things together and what we have is a pretty unpleasant view of, of the world and, and not a way to deal with an epidemic. I've read that other countries, say Germany, for example, have been recording their COVID deaths differently to us. And at first, some countries didn't even include care home deaths in their statistics. John, do you think it's possible that, that we're not the worst country for COVID mortality in Europe? Well, I think it is possible. I think really the problem with the numbers is that it's impossible to know what they mean. Because we've changed the way that we're recording, because they're not comparable with previous years, because we've adopted this strange way of recording a positive test within 28 days. And by the way, that, that's another whole can of worms. You cannot equate a positive test result by PCR testing with a case. Mm. I mean, you know, a case is a symptomatic person who's ill of a disease. Um, and if I just give you another example, you know, if you went around the population and you did the same sort of PCR testing for tuberculosis, mycobacterium tuberculosis bacterium, you'd probably find it in quite a few people. It doesn't mean they've got to tuberculosis mm -hmm. it's probably just passing through or on their skin or somewhere but the fact that you can detect something does not mean to say it's pathogenic and it's the same with the, with the covid virus so i think the actual the the numbers 
from our country and from other countries are very difficult to interpret within country and they're essentially impossible to interpret between countries and that's why I think the most useful measure of what's been happening is all-cause mortality. Mm. So all-cause mortality is where you just look at the envelope of all deaths that have been happening over the last year and yes there's been a slight increase this year due to this new disease mm. but basically if you go back about 15 years it's not what we've been told is unprecedented, it's very precedented. Many of the years within the last 30 years have had death rates the same as or higher than this year's death rate. So that suggests that even though we've had a pandemic, it isn't really anything dramatically out of the ordinary, even though it was feared to be at the beginning. John, on the 6th of January, you said on Talk Radio that we were seeing mortality that was, quote, well within the envelope of what normally happens this time of year. I think you actually said we're below average point of the deaths at this time of year. And then you had this full fact, fact-checking organisation, one of the many, you know, invigilators of what we say. They said that what you claim was incorrect and they said over the four final weeks of 2020, the number of deaths was 16% above the 27-year average and 20% above the five-year average. H- how would you respond to that correction? I did read the, the bit that they'd written about that. They mentioned towards the end of their thing, as far as I could see, that they thought correcting for population was quite important but didn't make that much difference. I think it's essential to correct for population because uh, it makes a difference of about 20% over the last 30 years uh, or so. So I think it's essential to do that. And when you do that, actually, their alleged difference actually becomes a fair bit smaller. However, it came out on that interview, if you look at the median number of deaths per week calculated from the ONS statistics for the last 27 years, which are what's available, uh, and you compare this year's numbers to them, what you see is a quite a big spike in April. So something definite happened in March, April last year uh, when we had the new pandemic. And, and really what happened then was that a lot of elderly people died of respiratory infections, which were attributed to COVID. So that's, that's what happened. Whether that was true or not, we can argue about, but nevertheless, probably quite a few of them were. If you actually look at those numbers over the last few weeks now from November till now, there is no spike. So whether it's slightly above average, whether it's slightly below average, the fact is it's not unprecedented and nothing dramatic is happening right now. So uh, the general point I was making was was true. I suppose one can always argue around the corners of the, the actual numbers. What we do know is that there's been a big increase in deaths in the home. I mean, as, as well as being a pathologist, you know, you're a doctor of medicine, you've been a, in charge of sort of cancer specialisms. Do you think that that spike of about 30, 40,000 people dying in their own home? I mean, we hear on Planet Normal of people being either too frightened to go to the hospital because of COVID, because of what they've seen on the TV, or NHS services having shut down. And do, do you think that that's caused some of those excess deaths? Yes, well, of course, as with all these specific figures, it is quite difficult to get to the bottom of what's been happening. But the key thing is that we're all on the same side in this. The, the, the debate has been presented as quite a polarised mm. debate with, you know, for lockdown and against lockdown and for the government and against the government. But the government has been, I, I believe, in good faith, trying to do the right thing, but it's been basing its advice, it's been basing its actions on rather narrow advice that it's been taking. But obviously we all understand that governments often have a difficult uh, mm. line to tread uh, in between making the least worst choices. I mean, sometimes there are no easy choices. It's just that it's highly contentious whether these lockdowns are the least worst choice or whether they're causing more damage than the actual virus itself. I, I fear the latter. I think that there's quite good evidence to suggest that not only are the lockdowns not very effective in stopping the virus spreading um, and possibly even pushing it to spread in ways or, or to change itself in ways that aren't in our best interests, but that the other deaths due to all these other things uh, that we've, we've been talking about are actually as big as or possibly outweigh the viral deaths, in which case, you know, what on earth are we doing? Why have we gone down this route? Certainly, why have we gone down this route without discussing it fully and openly and having a proper uh, you know, bedding in of what's the right approach? Yes, I, I was going to ask you, actually, could lockdown possibly have made the virus more deadly by forcing it to? I mean, we're hearing a lot about these mutations, aren't we? Could could us all being locked down, could that have made the virus have to be more ingenious about the, the, the new form it assumed? Well, it's, I, I think it's difficult for people to fully understand how, how mm. evolution works. The way evolution works is the virus doesn't know anything about going on. These are just little particles that are floating around in the atmosphere. The summary of evolution, if you like, is if you change the environment, you change the beast. Mm. So if you change the environment, basically only those beasts that survive in the new environment survive. So if you change or try and change the rules of human interaction, the viral particles that spread around will be the viral particles best adapted to spreading around in the new environment, whatever that is. 
So normally uh, with things like respiratory viruses, they tend to mutate to less virulent forms because most of the time we have a cold, you know, we might feel a bit under the weather, but we don't necessarily even take time off work with it. So we go to work, we spread it to other people, that causes us all to get immunity to it, and then that dies away or another mild form comes along. But of course, if you change the environment so that actually the way in which it spreads is by making people iller, and those people have to be taken to hospitals where they then expose uh, you know, other patients in the hospital and the healthcare staff to the more worse variant of it, it's quite possible, I don't think we've got definitive evidence on that, but it's quite possible that actually you make the virus worse than it otherwise would have been. That's a very good explanation for a non-scientist, John. I'm very grateful for that. Every day on the news, we hear these very scary figures, you know, thousands of new COVID cases. Do you think we'll ever have a true picture of what constitutes an infectious COVID case? given the debate over the reliability of the various testing methods? I think it's very difficult to achieve that in the current circumstances because there's too much, I think, vested interest in certain ways of doing things that have already been done. But the the bottom line is PCR is a quite a finicky test. It's um, when you when you do 25 cycles of PCR, uh, you know, you multiply things something like 34 million times. Uh, if you do 35 cycles, it's 34 billion times. So the, the test is, is quite sensitive to operator, so it's quite sensitive to contamination. And the real question is, is what constitutes a COVID case? Is it reasonable to suggest that a detection of a bit of COVID RNA means that that person has the disease of COVID. And I think it's quite clear, I mean, there really isn't any debate about this in scientific and medical circles. It's quite clear that you cannot simply equate those two things. It's certainly quite possible to discover viral particles and get a positive test while having not only no symptoms, but really nothing that would suggest that you had the disease. So I think to equate those two things is, is building in misinformation essentially into the system. And that's why I say it's very difficult to get to the bottom of, of the deaths. I mean, I was slightly worried recently to hear an ex-government health minister, Jeremy Hunt, sort of suggesting that maybe we should only have a thousand cases before we end the lockdown. And this is, I have to say that is scientific and medical twaddle. It's complete nonsense. It's a bit like if the government decided it was going to have a, uh, an anti-obesity run and it sort of introduced a policy and said something like, right, nobody's allowed to go to the restaurant until there are fewer than a thousand people who weigh more than 11 stone or something <laughs> like that. It won't work because the virus doesn't care what we think and the maths and the way the virus spreads will determine that. And setting arbitrary targets is just a recipe for more unhappiness, I think, and for more failure of policy. Tragically, we have seen many in- infections and deaths which have taken place in care homes and hospitals, so-called nosocomial infections that why was the NHS so unprepared for the epidemic, do you think? I mean, we're supposed to have had a pandemic plan, aren't we? I, I think, unfortunately, the NHS in this particular instance has suffered the way it, it suffered, as I've witnessed it suffering throughout my career. Uh, it suffered too much from top-downism, and it doesn't make enough use of the talents of the the people who work within it uh, to come up with good ideas and ways of managing things. It has to all be the same and it has to be top down and it just doesn't work very well. It's a very clunky, old fashioned system. And I think certainly one of the consequences, I hope, uh, of this year will be that we'll have, unfortunately, have to have uh, another major relook at whether the NHS is a fit for purpose model uh, in this day and age. I think I think there are other ways of doing it which would could quite easily be better. Something we're hearing about every week on Planet Normal. I mean, you've you've had cancer as one of your specialisms is people who have been unable to continue cancer treatment, let alone get a get a diagnosis. And one of the amazing things, John, to me was that the NHS or indeed the government requisitioned the private hospitals at, at, for, you know, for hundreds and hundreds of millions of pounds. But we heard recently that uh, two thirds of those hospitals were never used. I mean, in your day or in the days of more veterans, doctors they were fever hospitals in previous um, epidemics I agree I mean I, I think it should have been done from from right last year when we we showed what's possible by doing the Nightingale hospitals so we we managed to make all these hospitals in double quick time and then never used them clearly trying to run ordinary NHS hospitals as simultaneous hospitals for general medical care including all different things and infectious disease control hospitals is ridiculous because it can't possibly work. And the lack of medical care that's been given over the last year has been has been a self-imposed own goal. 
Yes, I absolutely think we should have commissioned the Nightingale hospitals and used them as fever hospitals. Most people or very many people with COVID are not that ill, so they could have been looked after in fever hospitals with perhaps a lower standard of uh, or lower intensity of nursing care and perhaps a lower standard of nursing care than you might get in acute hospitals where people have all sorts of other conditions in. But it, it, it doesn't seem to have even been looked at and I think that's just a nonsense really and a, another failure of, of of seeing the big picture. I, I think that's the trouble. I think. My, my take is that SAGE has become very invested in a lot of details to do with epidemiology and modelling approaches to viruses. And they've become very invested in this. And a lot of, in a lot of areas, the big picture has been missed. Isn't there this very unpleasant, though, polarisation? We had a previous guest on Planet Normal was Professor Shanetra Gupta. You'll know one of the world's leading epidemiologists. I mean, she's been absolutely demonised for signing this great Barrington Declaration, which is arguing for focused protection of the vulnerable and uh, for saying, as you're implying today, John, that lockdown causes more harm than good. I mean, what are the implications for science when, you know, I mean, mean, you're not all mad, are you, if you're saying this stuff? I hope not. I I mean, I think what people don't understand, I mean, people who are not in in, in science don't understand is that when you go to scientific meetings, it's not people sort of uh, listening politely while other people present black and white results that everybody agrees with and then you go on to the next talk. There's ongoing, often highly impassioned Mm. argument about just about everything, because it's through that sort of argument and through that process that you actually do get scientific advice and you do be able to understand in more detail and more clearly you know, the way things work in the world, which is the, the aim of the whole thing, I guess. So it's actually quite normal for science to be quite impassioned. But in this particular case, what we've got is you know, there are people who know about this stuff and some of them are on SAGE and some of them are not on SAGE. But the thing is, because the understanding of it is not black and white, I mean, there's a, there's a contradiction in a way, isn't there, at the centre of the government's policy in this. On the one hand, they say this is a totally unprecedented thing. Mm. On the other hand, they tell us, but... Sage, you know exactly what we've got to do about it, and therefore there should be no discussion, and we should just get on and do what we're told. Well, clearly, those two points of view, which are both embedded in the government's policy, are not compatible. This is a, a virus which is a nasty respiratory virus, but it's within the range that, has, that humanity has sailed through before without massive disruption to society. So at the very least, it seems to me, there needs to be a much wider discussion about what the best way to deal with this. Not only because it's not sustainable to carry on doing this, whatever COVID does, but also surely we can't do this every time a new viral variant appears or every time a new type of virus appears, which will definitely happen in the future and possibly in the not very distant future as well. I think you may be making the fundamental mistake, John, of actually using logic there, because surely what's happened during this past 10 months is that people have been very, very frightened. And if we were to have on the evening news some of the 450 people who die every day of cancer, then that would be intolerable, wouldn't it? But we've had that night after night. And hasn't that changed the nature of the debate? And you you can sit there and say these things to me and they're true. But to some extent, they don't have any purchase against this vast wall of fear that's now been created. The way it's been presented, exactly. I mean, that that has created a vast wall of fear. And that's what we're trying to argue we should we should get away from, because surely for people to be able to understand what they're seeing, if they are only presented with one side of the story uh, on the news night after night after night after night. I mean, there are any number of regimes around the world who use that as their normal modus operandi, doesn't it? And it does work quite well, but it's not the truth. Death is a fact of life. And, uh, you know, what we need is to have a discussion about COVID and about the responses to COVID and about what we should do for future viruses. Um, that's actually a grown-up conversation, doesn't treat people like infants, uh, treats the population of the country like grown-ups who can understand sensible discussion and present it the way we normally present anything else. Mm. Professor Tim Spector of King's London, who's been running the very successful Zoe app, which has been a very valuable source of information during the pandemic, he said a couple of days ago that large gatherings like big weddings won't be possible till 2022. I mean, I was sort of really uh, taken aback by that. And I thought, will the scientists ever release their grip on society now? I mean, really, should any scientist be saying you won't be able to have a big, lovely wedding until, you know, sort of the summer after this one? What what do you think, John? Well, I mean, I'm speaking as somebody who's a doctor, also a scientist. I understand nerdy scientists because to some extent I'm a bit of one myself. Mm -hmm. But I think nerdy scientists are the last people to be running society. (laughs) I'm glad you said that, not me. Yeah. Because they can't, they, they, they focus on what they focus on and they tend to miss the big picture. And the fact is, there's more to life than COVID. 
there's more to life than death. Apart from anything else, the fact is that this virus, as everybody agrees, has very little effect on people under 60 if they're not already ill with other conditions. So to shut down the whole of that sector of society on, in the name of protecting lives in the elderly population society doesn't make any sense anyway. And I, frankly, I don't think uh, people who are advising the government on these things should be speaking out in public. I mean, I think I mean, in the old days, people who advised government kept quiet in public because they gave their advice to government and government acted on it. All this briefing of the media by all different things basically to say how important their research is um, and how, how, you know, what a major effect this is going to have on society. I, I really can't understand the motivation for it, frankly. I, I, I think it's and I think it's actually scientifically and medically completely wrong. So I, I disagree on on all levels with that sort of statement. And finally, how in the in the future, how do you think pathologists like yourself in a hundred years time will look back on this thing called the COVID-19 pandemic? Uh, I think it, when the dust settles on this and it's looked back on, well, I'd like to say that it'll be seen as, a, as an overreaction to, to a new pathogen that was a one-off thing that people learned from and that, was, that they never did again. I'm not sure that I think this hasn't got so big. I mean, so many governments have become so deeply embroiled in a very similar approach that uh, I'm not sure that when things get this big, it's possible to get uh, you know a clear picture of it afterwards because there's so many vested interests in um, you know keeping a particular narrative. So I think there may be a polarization in the ways that this is viewed. But I think that the correct way to view it will be that it, we overdid it.